Ezekiel was a prophet, but Ezekiel was part of the group of people that were in the first wave of exiles from Jerusalem to Babylon whenever the exile happened. They were taking out the most prominent people, the most well-educated, the most outspoken, and he was among those that got removed from his home, and he got shipped out to Babylon. And for five years, he's there wondering where's God in all this, wondering about his life, his family, what's going on, and he's by this river, and he has this vision. And in this vision, he sees a cloud, and under the cloud are these animals with multiple heads and multiple feet, multiple wings, and above them is this platform, and on top of this platform is this throne, and in the throne is the brilliant glory of God, and out of the glory of God says, Ezekiel, you're my prophet, go and tell the people to turn to me and live. And so Ezekiel goes and he starts telling all the people, turn to God and live, and they all do, and they live happily ever after. No, they don't. No, (laughs) of course not. So they have a hard time turning toward God. They're human beings. Ezekiel's telling them, please turn back to God. More are exiled. Ezekiel has another vision after this of that same throne with the glory of God shown above it, and it's above the temple this time. And in front of the temple are these pillars, these idols that have been built. And people are worshiping these idols. Women are worshiping one idol. Men are worshiping another idol. And all of a sudden, this throne, this glowing glory of God starts to move away from the temple toward Babylon. And the glory of God speaks to Ezekiel. I'm going to Babylon. I'm going ahead of you. I will be with my people. Tell them, turn to me and live. Now, as I'm studying today's scripture, Ezekiel's trying to do that to the people right now, almost talking as if he's a lawyer, arguing about why they need to turn to God and live. But I got stuck on that glory of God thing as I was studying about Ezekiel. What does glory even mean? So kids, the word today is glory. In the Hebrew, the word glory is kavod. Everybody say kavod. K-A-V-O-D, kavod. And the literal translation of kavod in the Old Testament is heavy. The best example comes from, I think it's the book of Kings, where this man dies, and they say, he was kavod, kavod. He was heavy, heavy. He was a big guy, basically, you know. Uh, But it also means more than just that sense of weight of being heavy. It's the heaviness of the presence of God. The glory of God is the magnitude of this presence. It's immense. It's immeasurable. It's gravitas. It's the heaviness, the weightiness, so much so that you can't escape it. It's there. It's in you. It's all about you. And you feel the pressure of that weight on you. That's the glory of God. And I bring this up because Paul is writing to the people of Philippi, and he uses this phrase, the glory of God, which we're going to get to in just a second. Paul's writing to the people of Philippi. Now, this is the first time that Paul writes to anybody in Eastern Europe, and this is the first letter that they've gotten to him, and it's really kind of a thank you note because Paul's in prison, and they're, they're, the people in Philippi brought him some, some snacks in prison, and there he is in prison. And he's like, man, this is really nice. I'll tell them thank you. It's more than that, but this is him writing to them to express his gratitude for their presence and their ministry to him. But Philippi is a place where people would go to retire. Think of Florida, right? (laughs) Philippi, though, was filled with people that were in the Roman military, and they were retiring. So patriotism was very high there. National identity was very high there. And if you were a Christian, you were going to have a hard time in Philippi being you, praising Jesus. You could be hurt. You could be arrested. You could be killed. So Paul's writing to a group of people that are wrestling with this. And Paul begins by saying, if I die, I get to see Jesus. I count that as a win. That's a gain. If I don't die, I get to share Jesus. I count that as a win. That's a gain. So whether I live or whether I die, I'm with Jesus, and I get to share that with others. So he's inviting them in this letter to think this way. And if you turn in your hymnals, hymnals, your Bible, the black one there. Uh, It's been one of those days, Heather. Yes. If you turn in your Bible to page 954, 954 of your Bible there, 
you're going to see what he tells the people. He says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, at verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Not the mind of the Romans, not the mind of the state, of the politics. Let the mind that you have be like that of Christ Jesus. And then he shares with them one of the oldest pieces of literature in the New Testament. It's called the Christ hymn, or the Philippians hymn, or the Christ poem. And it begins at verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. That's what Adam did. That's what we do as human beings. We exploit any power that we get. We're going to take advantage of it. We can't help but do it. It is a natural response for us, but not for Jesus, not for the Son of God. He didn't exploit it. In fact, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. The people that are listening to this would have recognized Isaiah and the suffering servant. They would have been referencing their heritage. And he said he was, he, and, and he he'd take the form of the slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. In other words, Jesus became like every single one of us to feel what we're feeling, to go through life like we go through life. And he became obedient to this humility, humiliation to the point of death, even death on a cross the Romans' favorite way to execute people. And then it shifts. Therefore, God also highly exalted him, lifted him up, raised him up, resurrected him, and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. At the very presence of this powerful, weighty, heavy name, you would fall on your knees in worship. He says that every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, everywhere. And every tongue should confess. You can't help but confess. And then the earliest creed that we have is Jesus Christ is Lord. And then how does he close it? To the glory of God the Father, to the magnitude, to the immenseness, to the weightiness, to the heaviness that is the glory of God. Paul's writing to a group of people to let them know that they need to have this mindset, the mindset of this Christ, not to take advantage of people, to humble ourselves, to be of servant, almost as a slave to other people. And that's where we fall down on our knees underneath the weight of the glory of God. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus is in Jerusalem. Now, he's been trying to get there for a while, and he's finally made it. Does anybody in here remember how Jesus came into Jerusalem? Band, you can't answer. You were at first service. How does he get into Jerusalem? Oh, you were last night, Curtis. You were here last night. Don't you do it. Does anybody remember? On a colt, on a donkey, on the foul of a donkey. But I'll be honest with you. Every time I picture this, I picture like a little miniature pony, you know, with the short ones, and there's Jesus, you know, kind of coming in, coming into Jerusalem. And people are throwing down cloth in front of them and, and, and palm branches. And what are they shouting? Hosanna, which literally translates, save us. They're renouncing that this is the Messiah, that he has all the authority of God. They see him. They're falling down on their knees underneath the pressure and the weight of the presence of Jesus. They can't help but do it. And behind them is a crowd of people that are following this guy into Jerusalem. And where's the first place he goes? Into the temple. He doesn't even go all the way in. He gets to the outer courts of the temple and he sees people are exchanging money for sacrifices in the temple. I'm going to give $10 to get some temple coins to go buy that goat because my goat at home is really precious to me and I don't know if I really want to sacrifice it just yet, so I'm going to buy a sacrifice. And Jesus is throwing over tables and he's tumping over the money and he's stopping commerce for the day. Do you think that the temple leaders are happy about this? No. And they see that he's acting as one with authority. In fact, he says, this is my father's house and you are turning it into a den of thieves. He's announcing his authority, and he has an entourage of people behind him doing this. And so our lesson today is the next day. And where does Jesus go? <laughs> right back into the temple. I can just imagine him walking in, and there's that one merchant that's still finding coins behind the cracks and crevices, and he sees him coming, and he goes, oh, great, you again? Yeah. There's Jesus going back into the temple, and the leadership meets him. And they're, they're like a force. Who gives you this authority? By what authority do you have to do all this? And Jesus says, well, if you can answer my question, I'll answer yours. Where did John's baptism come from, heaven or earth? And they know. They know 
as they're trying to trap him, if, they, ooh, if, if we say from heaven, this group over here is going to have a field day, and we can't have that. If we say from earth, this group over here is going to have a field day, and ah, what are we going to do? I know. Say nothing. So they say, we don't know. And he goes, I know. So let's, let me tell you a story about a guy and his sons. There's his father. He has two sons. He tells the first one, go out into the vineyard and work. And he says, I don't really want to today, Dad. I'm kind of busy. But he does anyway. The second one, he says, go out into the field and work. And he goes, I'm on it. And then he does it. Which one got into the kingdom of heaven first? And they all know the answer to this one. The first one did. And he says, that's why the tax collector and the prostitute and those people that you look down on and that are less than, they're going to get into the kingdom of heaven first because they saw John. They saw his righteousness. They felt the glory of God through him, and they believed. You have heard it and still have yet to come to believe in it. Now, just a caveat, he never says they're not going to get into the kingdom of heaven. He just says that these are going to get into the kingdom of heaven first because they are caught up in the magnitude of the glory of God, the immenseness of it. Paul closes his lesson today, this letter, with this little line. He says to the Philippians, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And at first that kind of sounds like I'm supposed to do it on my own, but that's not what he's getting at. Fear and trembling is more like awe and wonder and just like, oh, I can't believe this is so real and so beautiful and so true. And we've had those moments where you can feel just the presence of God surrounding you. You just know. You can't qualify it, quantify it. You just know. Work out for your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you to both will and to work for everything that is good in God's sight. In other words, that weight, that heaviness, that Ezekiel was, in, was seeing, that, that, that Paul was sharing, that Jesus is promoting, that weight is within each and every one of us. That heaviness is in each and every one of us. That glory of God is in each and every one of us. And all it wants to do is burst out and flood the world with God's grace and God's mercy and God's love and God's forgiveness. So share this weight. Share this heaviness. It's glorious. Amen.